Well, shalom, y'all. And today we're going to look at 2 Kings 19, 9 through 18. This is the passage. Elijah is coming off a great victory, uh, God's victory over the prophets of Baal. And apparently Elijah is struck with depression or panic or fear or whatever, and he runs away. He runs south uh, through Israel, through Judah, even into the wilderness. And finally, after about six weeks, he encounters God at Mount Sinai in a cave. And God asks a very important question to Elijah what are you doing here, Elijah? And I think that's the point of the passage and its meaning for us today because we're no longer, we're not Elijah, but we are ourselves. And no matter how long it's taken us to get to where we are and no matter what we've had to go through, we are here now. In the famous words of Buckaroo Banzai, no matter where you go, there you are. And the point is, we are where we are now and God's question to us is exactly the same as God's question to Elijah, what are you doing here? And in other words, God has stuff for us to do, and he wants us to get ready to do it. And he wants Elijah to get ready to do things. So join me as I look at uh, 1 Kings 19, 9 through 18, and uh, see where that leads us. Well, I, I wanted to thank Joel for uh, filling in for me last week. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a little upset because he, he really had the, the, the great passage, you know, the, the, uh, the Elijah confrontation with the Baal prophets. And I had this whole uh, worldwide wrestling scenario, death cage match between Elijah and Baal, and uh, Ric Flair was going to make an appearance. And, but, but that's okay. I, just, I appreciate Joel doing it, and I'll, I'll save my, my wrestling metaphor for later. Uh, I, I'm also uh, kind of not, not upset, but, but bothered because this passage that we're looking at today, uh, 1 Kings 19, 9 through 18, is, is a much more confusing passage to me. And I, I, I wonder sometimes if, if God says, okay, John, this is a passage you really need to work with and struggle with, so I'm going to give it to you. And I, I, I worked and struggled with this passage, and I think I, I've got a handle on it. I think I know what its message is to us today, but I, I just wanted to start out to say that that I might be wrong, and I'll try to point out where I'm wrong as we go along. But uh, it, it's a very strange passage in that Elijah is not acting much like a prophet. You know, I, I started off by by thinking, well, maybe I'll call this the fasting prophet because he, you know, he, he has this forty day fast, or maybe the running prophet. Or maybe the depressed prophet, or maybe the scared prophet, or maybe even the appointed prophet. But I finally decided, you know, he's a human prophet, because what he's experiencing is exactly the same kind of thing that we experience. And I think that's the message to us today, is, is that, you know, we all experience downtimes like Elijah did, and we need to be ready for that. So I, after going through all this, I finally decided, okay, the point of the whole thing is God's question to Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? And so that's kind of what I want to build it around. And that made me think of that great existential theologian, Buckaroo Banzai. Now, I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard of him before, but he has a very, very famous quote is that no matter where you go, there you are. Now, let me paraphrase that and tease out the theological meaning just a little bit. But no matter where you go, no matter how long it took you to get there, no matter what you had to go through to get there, once you arrive, there you are. And, and I think that's what Elijah is going through. And I think that is what we're going through because we, we are all here. We, we all arrived at today somehow. I don't know how long it took us or what we had to go through, but when we got here, here we are. And the question is, what are you going to do about it? And I think that's Elijah's God's question to Elijah. And I think that that's God's question to us is what are we going to do? What are we doing here today? Uh, and, and just to, to steal a little bit of thunder from the end. I mean, if you are alive today, that means God has something he wants you to do today. And the real question is, what are you going to do about it? And I think that's the point of the passage as we go through. So just to, to step back a little bit and look at context, Elijah had this great victory. I'm sorry, God had a great victory over the prophets of Baal. And it happens at a very specific place in Israel, Mount Carmel. And uh, from Mount Carmel on a clear day, you can see across Israel. You can see the, the ocean on one side and, and you can see across the Jordan on the other. And, and you can see from Mount Hermon in the north, way, way, way down south. 
Now, the importance of all that is that means if there's a big fire and conflagration on top of Mount Carmel, almost everybody in Israel can see it. So this was not something that just happened in the background. This was a victory that was visible to almost everyone in Israel, and they knew that God was, was there and God was more powerful than the prophets of Baal. And that's why you see people uh, confessing that God is God and God is not Baal in the story. So this, this is a great victory. And then in the, the midst of this great victory, I, I, Elijah just goes crazy. He, he hears that Jezebel is, is trying to kill him and he runs. So he runs south all the way through Israel. He runs south all the way through Judah. He runs south into the wilderness. And it just, it's not a rational uh, point of view. I mean, he's had this great victory and all of a sudden he gets afraid and he starts running. And I, I think there is some, there's some humanness in there because very often at times of our greatest victory, we're also, um, um, liable, or we, we might also find that we get some depression. I, I know I was in sales with Hewlett Packard for a long time, and I, occasionally I just, I'd have a great sales year. I just, December was wonderful, and I'd break quota and, you know, get all kinds of praise, and everything was wonderful. And then uh, January 1st, I, I had nothing. And I, I, I went from sort of a very, very high to a very, very low to say, okay, well, now what? Okay, you know, that was really good in December, but now what? I, I celebrated in December, but now what do I do? And that might be a little bit of what Elijah was, was facing. Anyhow, in his escape, uh, God provides for him. He, he becomes exhausted in the wilderness. The angel of the Lord feeds him dinner and lets him sleep some more and feeds him dinner. And apparently it was a good dinner because then he doesn't eat again for 40 days because he's headed more south to Mount Sinai. The, the text says Mount Horeb, but another name for that is Mount Sinai, where Moses encountered God and got the law. And we're going to see a lot of parallels between the Exodus, you got the whole wilderness theme, you got the Mount Sinai theme, and Elijah and Moses. So it's just, it's, it's kind of thinking back to how Moses handled things, and we can compare and contrast that to how Elijah handled things. And uh, th there are some similarities, but th there are some differences. In the middle of the desert, here's one of the similarities with Moses, is Elijah says, God, kill me. Take me home now. I, I wasn't as good as my father's. I can't handle this. Just kill me. Now, I, again, this confuses me because he was afraid that Jezebel was going to kill him, but it's okay for God to kill him. I, I just Elijah, I think, I could be wrong, is, is not really in his right mind. So when you are depressed, you, you, you lose a correct vision of reality. You see things that aren't right and you, you have opinions that aren't right. Elijah thinks he's uh, uh, you know, going to be killed and he's alone and, and all kinds of things. And he's not. God is with him. God is protecting him. God demonstrated victory over all the Baal prophets. So Elijah just is not in his right mind. So he, he, he has this 40-day fast. He goes way deep in the wilderness. He's in Mount Sinai, and he's in his cave. And that's where we pick up today's text. So 1 Kings 19.9. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? A, a lot going on in, in this passage. But remember, a great existential theologian, Buckaroo Banzai, Elijah is the same guy when he gets to wherever he's going as he was when he left. Okay, So regardless of what he went through to get there, when he got there, there he was. Now, he's, he's in his cave. Now, I, I don't I don't know if this is his man cave. I don't know if he has a, you know, a, a widescreen TV and a pool table and a little tiki bar in the corner. Um, I, I don't know if Elijah was Southern Baptist or not. Although he did have that thing where he kept trying to baptize the axe head. And I, so I don't know, but, but, but this is a retreat for Elijah. It's, it's a cave. It's, it's a womb like thing. He's run as far as he can. And he, he goes in this cave and he just kind of pulls everything in around him because apparently he just can't face the sight of the world. And I, if many of y'all have suffered from depression or know people who have suffered from depression, that's, that, that's kind of a common thing. They just, they can't handle it. They just, just, they want to escape from the whole world. So I think that's what's going on here. 
It says he came to a cave and lodged there. And the, the, the Hebrew word, uh, <clears throat> it, it may be a long time lodging or it may just be overnight. There's, there's no real way to tell. And uh, something, this next phrase that comes across in the text to me is not translated well, and I'll, I'll explain it to you. My text says, then he came there to a cave and lodged there and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Behold, uh, there's a very specific Hebrew word here. And uh, behold is not a bad translation, but it doesn't carry all the power and um, uh, impact of the Hebrew word. So I, I, in my Bible, anytime I see this word behold, and I look it back and it's that Hebrew word, I translate it as Shazam. Because this is something really important. This is something completely different than anything that's happened before. And it's like, listen, because something important is coming. So this is this is a powerful word. And sometimes if we just read, behold, some translations say suddenly, it doesn't carry that the power of the Hebrew word. So this is this is bingo, baby. I don't know. This is something to catch your attention. And what the attention getting is the word of the Lord came to Elijah. He's run for, I don't know, six weeks. He's been trying to avoid the Lord. I don't know. And he's gone as far as he can. He's wrapped his womb around him. He's in, in his cave. And the word of the Lord comes to him. That God reaches out to him, <clears throat> perhaps at Isaiah, Elijah's lowest point, and says, speaks to him. And maybe Elijah just had to reach rock bottom before he was willing to listen to God. I, I don't know. But as far as he can run, as far as he can go, as much as he tries to escape the world, once he gets there, there he is, and there he got, there God is too. We see kind of the same story in, in Jonah. So uh, the word of the Lord came to him, and the, the Lord said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, I just, I don't know about you, but I immediately identify with, with that phrase, because I just, in my ear, I can hear any number of parents or relatives <laughs> saying that exact thing. Do you know what you've done? Now, it doesn't mean they don't know when they're just checking. They know exactly what I had done. And God knows exactly what Jonah has done. This is similar to in the Garden of Eden, where God asked Adam, where are you? God knows. But the point is, is not to give information to God. The point is to confront the person, to confront me. Do I know what I have done? Well, yeah, most of the time I did. I just didn't want to get caught. But but it's to, to make me realize that I have done something wrong, that I have done gone the wrong way. So this is a confrontation of God to Elijah, just saying, what are you doing here? And it, it also makes me think that, that some people might say that Elijah was following God's call to Mount Sinai. Now, I, it's not clear to me. It doesn't really say that in the text anywhere. The angel that feeds him says, you have a great journey ahead of you. But the fact that God says, what are you doing here, tends to make me think that Elijah wasn't following God's will, that maybe Elijah was trying to, to run away from things. So this is, this is a little bit of a tough love. God said, there is no escape. You've got to confront yourself and you've got to confront me because now you're where you're at. Well, I, I guess that makes sense grammatically. Also note, and in, in, in my translation, and I went back and I checked this with the Hebrew, my translation says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And that implies it's not, it's, it's, a, it's not, you know, why are you here? It's what are you doing here? What are you doing? And I think Eli God wants Elijah to recognize the fact that Elijah is, is running away. He's depressed. He's scared. He's focused on other people and what's happening to them as opposed to focusing on God. Okay, and he's he's having a pity party, and he's he's all wound up because he he's not focusing on God. So God said, "What are you doing here? Okay, you're hiding. You're doing nothing. I have things for you to do." Stop focusing on Jezebel. Stop focusing on Ahab. Stop focusing on Israel. Stop focusing on yourself because I have things for you to do. So, so God is, is kind of tough love here confronting Elijah. And Elijah, very, very human. And, and, and I often uh, use the same technique as a, as a young child. So look at verse 10. He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord the God of hosts for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they seek my life to take it away. Okay. I don't know if this is called transference or whatever, but when you're in trouble, you try to get somebody else in trouble with you. 
Okay, so the first thing Elijah does is says, I, I've been zealous. In fact, he, he actually uses the Hebrew word for zealous twice. So he's saying, I, I was zealous, zealous. He's putting some emphasis on it. I was completely loyal. And I kind of that little thing to God is, and look what it got me. I'm here in a cave and Jezebel wants to kill me. So, oh, poor me, poor me. I was loyal and it didn't do me any good. Those people who weren't loyal, let's look at the Israelites now. What'd they do? They uh, forsook your covenant, tore down your altars and killed your prophets. And now I'm all alone. What are you going to do about that, God? And I just, again, to my mind, I can just hear God, maybe saying to himself, maybe saying to Elijah. So when Elijah says, uh, they've forsaken your covenant. And God says to Elijah, yeah, you're right, but it's my covenant and I'll handle it and I will handle it. What does that have to do with you? Uh, you know, and they have uh, they've torn down your altars. Yeah, you're right. They tore down my altars and I'm going to handle it. What does that have to do with you and killed your prophets with the sword? Well, yeah, they did, but they're my prophets and I'm going to handle it. And the important thing is I protected you and you ran away. So I, I, I don't see that back and forth in the text, but I can almost imagine it going on in my mind because God is trying to get Elijah to see that God is with him and that he needs to have faith in God and, and stay, stay close to God because God will provide for him. It's, it's, it's all that, that whole Old Testament theme. So then Elijah says, I am alone and left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now, he's not alone because God says that there, there are 7,000 faithful people in Israel still. Plus, there was somebody helped Elijah kill those prophets of Baal, and there was somebody that helped hide the prophets of God. So Elijah is not alone. He has God with him, if, if nothing else. And they says, they, they want to take my life away. And I, I just, again, in my mind, I can hear God say, well, so what? If that's what I want them to do, that's what will happen, and you need to remain faithful, okay? But God has shown that he will protect Elijah, and, and Elijah just uh, apparently at this point doesn't have enough faith in God to, to trust him, okay? So that's his, that's his response to God, and and. You know, God has just infinite patience because I just I know if I were God and I heard that from Elijah and, you know, I've been waiting 40 days for him to get to this cave so I can talk to him and he can be in the right frame of mind. I just I just might have to smite him with some holy fire. I just that's just me. But but clearly it's a good thing that I'm not God. So here is God's response to Elijah's um, uh, defense or trying to transfer the, the blame to somebody else. Uh, look at verse 11 and 12. And I just, I love this passage. So he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Same thing that Moses did in the same place. Of course, they can't see the Lord, but, but you can sense his presence or whatever. And behold, again, this behold here is one of those shazams and shazam, the Lord was passing by and a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking to pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. I just, I, I think that's that's so evocative to me. But I, I want to I want to play y'all something. See if I can see if anybody recognizes this. When you recognize this, raise your hand. All right, how many of y'all are looking for a shark? Okay. I, I just, it's an amazing piece of music. It's based around kind of a two note thing. It's just, it's, it's an example of how powerful music can be, but that's the shark's theme song. You don't see the shark at first, but you see the thing, you hear the theme song. And every time you hear that theme song, you know, the shark is close by. Now the theme song is not the shark. The shark is much more powerful. The, sh the shark is, is much more dangerous than the theme song. But when you hear the theme song, you know, the shark is close. And I think that's what we're getting here. We're getting God's theme song. 
Okay, he's not the fire. He's not the earthquake. He's not the wind. And if you think about it, those are the three most destructive uh, powers people in that culture would experience. So it, it's it, it, if you get caught in a, a windstorm, it's a life threatening situation. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it. If you caught in an earthquake or fire, you are helpless. So that's kind of God's theme song. But God is not in the song. God is greater than all those things. You take the three most powerful things in the world, and God is greater than those things. It's impossible to ignore. If you're in an earthquake, and they've been having them uh, a lot here in Columbia, you know it, and you cannot ignore it because weird things are happening. The earth is moving in ways that it's not supposed to move, and you will notice that. So this, this is God's theme music, okay? God's more powerful. It's just a notice, God is coming. And then you, you get this all this awesome stuff and then you get the quiet wind. And an, another word for the Holy Spirit is the holy wind, if you look at it in Hebrew. So I, I don't know that this is the Holy Spirit, but you get this gentle blowing. You might miss it if you're not paying attention. Uh, and the words here, uh, talking about the gentle blowing, it's, a, it's, a, it's something soft that you could miss it if you're not paying attention. And I, I think that's my experience with the Holy Spirit. Unless I am still and quiet, I miss it. Now, I can see the earthquake and, and all that stuff, but I, I miss that small voice of the Lord talking to me. I always joke that, that God has a variety of tools that he uses to communicate with me. He starts off with a feather and he, he kind of tickles the back of my neck and I go, this is a mosquito, get away from, get away from me. And uh, then he has something a little bit stronger. And finally, he works himself up to the holy two by four and he ow, gives me a slap across the head. And I go, oh, God, did you want to talk to me? But I could avoid that two by four if I would just pay more attention to that still quiet voice. So it's, it's, I think it's the Holy Spirit coming by. It is the presence of God, but God is not in the fire, the earthquake, or, or the wind. God is greater than those, and they just say, okay, he's coming. All right, so let's look at uh, verse 13. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance to the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? I think it's important he comes out of the cave. He's starting to deal perhaps with his depression. He's making that first step back out into the world. He's, he's removed himself from the womb and he's come out to encounter God. Now, remember, encountering God is the answer to all the problems. It was the answer to the problem for Moses. It's the answer to, to our problems today. And Elijah is at least making that, that first step. He covers his head so he can't actually see God, but he can experience God. So he's, he's making some steps, and God asked him exactly the same question again. I, we can argue about why God did that, but, but God does it, at least the way it's, it's presented here in the text. So let's look at verse 14 and see if Elijah has learned anything in the, the previous few verses. Verse 14. Then he said, I have been zealous for the, oh, Elijah, come on. Okay, he repeats himself exactly. He even repeats zealous twice. So it's exactly the same thing he said in his first response to God. This, this reminds me of, of Job and, and Moses arguing with God and some other people. And Job and Moses kind of resolve that. Moses agrees to, to take the message to Egypt. And, and Job understands that he is not God. I just, it, it appears to me, and, and I could be wrong, that Elijah has learned nothing. He's, he's seen all the power of God. He's seen, you know, they, they pour water on the sacrifice and God burns it up, no trouble at all. He has seen God provide him food in the wilderness. He has seen God uh, allow him to fast for 40 days. He's got all these Moses Exodus connotations going on, pillar of fire, right? So God is in the fire. The pillar of fire uh, protected uh, the people in the Exodus. The wind uh, parted the Red Sea so the, the, the Hebrews could escape from. He, he sees all that. He knows all that. And he goes, eh, no, it doesn't apply to me. And then he whines some more. And he tries to shift blame some more. So I, I just, I could be wrong, but I'm afraid Elijah in his humanness hasn't changed at all. He is where he is. He got there by how he got there. And he didn't change at all along the way. And I think God wanted him to change because God had things for him to do. So I just, Elijah learned nothing. 
He's focusing on the problems of others. He's focusing on the attacks on God. He's focusing on how poor and pitiful he is. Now, we're much more spiritual today. We would never do anything like that. Okay? We would never panic when the church is under attack today. We would never try to transfer blame or responsibility from ourselves to others. We would never say, God, well, I don't have to do this because other people are doing this. I don't have to be a missionary because the church pays missionaries to go out and do stuff. I don't have to be a witness because people can turn on the, the TV on Sunday and, and, and watch and, and get a good witness. We would never do anything like that today. We would never think that we're so self-righteous. We would never be so scared that we would try to withdraw from the world and not present a Christian witness to the world. We would never do that, would we? Well, I'm afraid we do. Uh, and that we're, we're no different than Elijah when confronted with God saying, what are you doing here? We try to whine. We try to transfer the blame. We try to do anything except what God wants us to do. I, I, and I put myself, I'm not attacking anybody. I put myself in, in that category too. So, you know, we can kind of say, well, Elijah, you, you, you crazy guy, you, you poor prophet, why are you doing these things? But we do exactly the same thing today. We are in exactly the same situation. So I, I, I think that's the message to us today, you know, is, is where, however we got to where we are today, however long it took us, here we are. Now, what are you going to do? And I think God is asking us that question today in this text. What are you going to do? Are you going to follow me? You're going to go back in your cave. You're going to be a useless witness. What are you going to do? Because I have stuff for you to do, and I need you to get ready to do that. So I, I, I'm afraid that Elijah is still afraid of Israel, still afraid of Jezebel. We, we see him confront him later, so it's not quite clear for me in the text. Maybe uh, Elijah gets his head right, but, but we don't hear a lot about Elijah anymore. <coughs> now, it, it might be that he's, he's older now, and it, you know, being a prophet is too much trouble for him. I don't know, but in a way, this is, this is Elijah's swan song. So God no longer really gives him a, the word of the Lord is not coming to Elijah to spread anymore. So if, let's look at uh, 15 through 17 here. The Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael king over Aram. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of, I don't know, Shaphat, and oh man, I can't pronounce Abel Maholala something. Humla humla bumbusha. So you shall anoint as prophet in your place. God tells him to do four very specific things. Okay, and it, it's almost like he's treating him like a reluctant prophet. So it's Elijah. I can't trust you with the big picture anymore. I'm going to tell you do this, do this, do this, and do this. Might be wrong, but that just it kind of appears to me that way. And again, I, I'm reminded of Jonah. God said, Jonah, go to Nineveh and say these words. And, and Jonah and his passive aggressive tendencies went to Nineveh and said four words. He figured out the, the, the shortest way he could provide God's message. He only said those four words and the whole town was converted or the whole town was, was transformed. Okay. So I, 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 I could be wrong here, but it's, again, it's like God is saying, okay, Elijah, do this. And I think could be wrong here again. And God's saying, and then you're done. So let, let's look at what he says. He says, go back to Damascus. All that six weeks travel you spent getting down here, go back to where you were, because that's where I wanted you. And I got stuff for you to do there. So retrace your path, go to Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Now, Hazael is not king at this point. He's some weird beard out in the wilderness. But God is saying, Elijah, go and do this. Doesn't make any sense from an earthly point of view. This guy's not king, but you anoint him king because I have decided he's going to be one of my tools to deal with the Baal prophets. So, Elijah, you go do that. Easy to do. Find him, anoint him, and don't worry about anything else. I'll handle it. I, I'm perhaps reading more into the text, but that's kind of the sense I'm getting. Then you go to Israel the northern kingdom, and uh, anoint um, Jehu, king of Israel. Now, Jehu is not king of Israel now. Okay, so God is, is asking I, Elijah to do unusual things. 
but he's saying he's not, well, he's not asking, he's telling them to do it. And again, Jehu will be one of the ones that takes care of the whole Jezebel Baal situation. And then finally, he says, pass your mantle to Elisha. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I've obviously caught whatever Debbie has. <coughs> so this is a passing of the guard here. Uh, and again, I don't want to read too much into it, but, but God is saying, okay, Elijah, pass your mantle, pass your authority to Elijah. So I, I may not be finished with you, but, but your, your main days as a prophet are over. Now, maybe this was the grace of God because he was weak or old or tired. I don't know. But it's almost like, Elijah, if you're not going to trust me after all the things I've shown you that I can do, then I'm going to have to find another prophet. You're not going to be my prophet anymore. So, I, it, 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 again, might be a little bit off here, but certainly he's passing the mantle to Elisha. Elisha is going to be God's prophet from here on out. Elisha is going to do and announce what God wants him to. And now it's it's interesting to me, if you follow this pattern out, um, Elijah does not really ever anoint Hezael or Jehu. It's Elisha. So Elijah, the very first thing he does is pass the mantle. Elijah passes the mantle to Elisha. And then Elisha does what Elijah was supposed to do. I hope the, the, the J's and the Shas came out there. And so <clears throat> Elijah doesn't really do what God tells him to do. He, he, he passes the mantle to Elisha, but then Elisha is the one that does the rest of it. So that, that <clears throat> one of the reasons makes me think that the, the mantle really is being passed here. The authority as a prophet is really is going to someone else in, in, in the main part. Now, again, we hear from Elijah again, a couple of times, but it's, 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 it's not the, the major stuff that we see from him before. It's all Elisha. So God has still not answered Elijah's question. And, and Elijah has not answered God's question. So there is no communication going on here. And God just says, okay, if you're going to be that way. You do this, you do this, you do this, and you do this. And then uh, look in verse uh, 17. And he's telling Elijah why he's doing this. It shall come about the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elijah shall put to death. And he's saying, you know, you are so worried about those Baal people in Israel. I, I got it covered. Always had it covered. You could have stayed in Israel and done what I needed you to do. But you went south from Israel. You went south from Judah. You went south in the wilderness. And now you're going to have to go back to where you came from and please do what I tell you to do. So it's, it's God is saying, I got this problem. Those people that, uh, you know, broke my covenant. I got it. Those people that put up Asherah poles. I got it. Those people that kill my prophets. I got it. <clears throat> but Elijah does not have enough faith to trust that God has got it. So he runs away in the wilderness. Uh, now look at 18. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. So God is saying, eh, and you weren't alone. Remember those people that, that hid the prophets? They're still there. Remember those people who helped you kill a thousand Baal prophets? They're still there. I got 7,000 people in Israel. You are not alone. And the, the, the thing that's not stated here, but I think is clear from the context is, and I am with you which should be the answer to all of Elijah's concerns and problems. If, if, if he goes back to Israel and, and they kill him, God is still with him. God has not abandoned him. God is with him and God will take care of, the, of Elijah and restore him. So, it, But now that's a faith matter. And apparently Elijah just doesn't have that faith. So, But he's not alone. 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha. The last thing God tells him to do is the first thing he does. The son of Shaphat, while he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen before him, and he was with the 12th. And Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. Now, I, I don't know what the, the 12 pairs of oxen are, but clearly putting the mantle on is a transfer of power. So uh, Elijah is following God's orders and, and passing the prophecy mantle on to Elisha. And, and we'll see more stuff about Elisha as we go through. So, so what? What's the big deal about this? What's the big deal about the passage? 
First of all, I think be very careful in victory because sometimes when we are at our highest point, we are also liable to go to our lowest. It, it's, a, it's a short step from the top to the bottom sometimes. We, we, we think we're great, and then all of a sudden, the, the ground falls out from underneath us. So we have to remember, you know, at times of our success are probably Satan's favorite time to attack us. And he attacks us in all kinds of different ways. But just, just be aware of that. Doesn't mean that victory is not good. Doesn't mean that success isn't good. Doesn't mean you shouldn't enjoy it. But while you're enjoying it, just be a little careful that depression is not slipping up on you. I think the second message is that we can all get depressed. Anyone can get depressed. And it's, it's a terrible thing when it happens. And it's very hard to fix. Because <clears throat> what happens very often in depression is you lose your grip on reality. Right. You, 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 you have a much more depressed view of the world than is accurate. But more important and in the context of, of Elijah is I think sometimes you forget that God is not with you. You feel like maybe you've been abandoned. We lose sight of what is real and we start believing things that aren't real. I'm no good. I'm worthless. Uh, the Christianity is dead in America. Uh, the, the country is going to hell in a handbasket. Well, now that may be true, but but even if it does we as Christians are called to be witnesses in that handbasket as it goes to hell, because we are guaranteed that we are not going there. Even if it means our death, we need to remain strong. So I, I, depression is a terrible thing to deal with, but we have to remember that it's not a realistic view of the world and that, that God is with us. Even when we feel alone, God is with us. Be aware of God's theme music, okay? It's easy to hear, but be aware of it, but be aware that that's not God, okay? The theme music is not the shark. When you hear the theme music, okay, here's God, but listen for him in the quiet. And I think part of that is that to be quiet, we have to be quiet. We have to be still. Uh, the, the Psalm says, you know, be still and know that I am the Lord. And I think in today's society, it is so hard for us to be still. We are bombarded with so many different things. And I, you know, Em and I just come back from, from being in many times in the midst of huge crowds where there is no quiet, there is no peace. Uh, you, 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 again, you're looking at the Parthenon, presumably one of the most beautiful buildings of the world, and there are you know, 12 teenagers from Afghanistan making noise, and it just, it, it, it's not a peaceful environment. So sometimes we have to retreat from the world. Now, maybe that, you don't have to go in your cave, you know, it's, but, but it's, it's a quiet room. It's to say, I'm going to take time away from the world. I'm going to turn off the computer. I'm going to turn off the TV. I'm going to turn off my phone for half an hour and just listen to God. See what happens. Okay. Might hear from him. Never can tell. And remember that the power of God and have faith in the power of God. We can all trust God in the good times. I don't have a problem with that at all. It's much harder for me to trust God in the bad times. And I wonder if maybe a little bit of that's what's happening with Elijah, excuse me. It's, it's one thing to offer to die for God once. So Elijah confronts the Baal prophets and says, I'm willing to die for God. That's great. That's wonderful. It's another thing to be willing to die for God over and over again every day. And I think that's what we're called to do as Christians. We, we, we take up our cross. We'd be willing to sacrifice ourselves every day, regardless of what happens, because we have faith in Jesus and we have faith in God. And I think that's what we're doing here is Elijah lost sight of God in the bad times. God was there, but Elijah lost sight of him. And we have to be careful that the same God that's with us in the good times is also with us in the bad times and will redeem us and will restore us regardless of what the world does for us. So we, we need to be ready to die for God on a daily basis. Now, that's a strong, hard statement, but I think that's what the Bible calls us to do. And we are we should be ready for that because we have faith in God and his provision. So finally, what are you doing here? The famous words of Buckaroo Banzai, no matter where you go, there you are. You bring yourself to wherever you are. And the real question is not how you got there. The real question is, what are you going to do once you're there? What does God want you to do? You're, you're, you're here, regardless of where it is, regardless of where, it's, where God wants you to be or where God doesn't want you to be, you are there. 
And the question is, what are you going to do now? Have you retreated to your cave? Are you going to pull the covers over your head? But if you're here today, like I said earlier, that means that God has something he wants you to do today. Otherwise, he'd have called you to heaven. Okay. So our job is to say, okay, God, what am I doing here? What do you want me to do? And finally, remember that Elijah was a prophet, but he was human, just like we are. He was you know, subject to whining. He was subject to fasting, to running, to depression, to being scared, to, to whatever. But he was still God's appointed prophet. And we are too. Now, we're not prophets like Elijah. We're not, we're not carrying a new message from God. But when we study the Bible, when we preach the Bible, when we teach the Bible, we are speaking the word of God. And we need to make sure that we trust God, that we have faith in God, and that we know that God will deliver us no matter where we are. He can find us even in the cave. He can provide for us wherever we are. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for all your patience with us. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for all that you've done to us. And I just, I pray that we would take the time to hear you. And we would say, what are we doing here? And we would hear what you want us to do. And we would do it with all our hearts and minds and souls. Lord, we thank you for all your blessings. We thank you for all that you've done for us and pray that you would uh, take note of our prayer request today and that you would bring us all safely back next week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Mm -hmm.